We've been working our way through John chapter 6. We've been working our way through John chapter 6 for a while. And last week we looked at the crowd needing Jesus, searching for Jesus, and finding Jesus. And this week we get the beginning of Jesus' teachings to this crowd. And Jesus doesn't start off optimistically with this group. He chastises them. He calls them to account for their motivation and their attitude. And if that's not a lesson I need to know, if that's not a lesson we all need to visit, then I don't know what's up. So we're going to look at John chapter 6. The sermon is going to be from verses 26 through 27, where Jesus asks, are you pursuing material, physical things, temporary things? Or are you pursuing spiritual, eternal, valuable things? And so I want to give this a little context. So I'm going to read John chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. 22 through 27. So let's look at John chapter 6, verses 22 through 27, realizing we're actually going to stay in verses 26 and 27. This is what the text says, my friend. The next day, the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. A reference to feeding the 5,000 men, right? So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum searching Jesus. Sounds like the text from last week. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? I love that. And then Jesus answered them. Here's the text for today. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. That's familiar, right? Scripture memory verse. All right, there's a lot going on here, so I want to give you a sermon in the sentence a topic sentence, the big picture, so that we can hang the details on it. So one sentence, this is what the one sentence is. They misunderstood Jesus' mission and toiled, worked, for the wrong things. John chapter 6, verses 26 through 27. They misunderstood Jesus' mission and toiled for the wrong things. Now, there's two verses. I want to look at them as a slow roll. So we're going, to do, we're going to do verse 26, and then we'll do verse 27. So with this big idea in mind, let's look at verse 26. Remember verse 26? Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. First off, it says, truly, truly, remember that. That's truly, truly, amen. Listen up, listen up. Jesus says this every time he's about to lay down some heavy truth. This is Jesus saying, you might not have been paying attention, but I need you to pay attention right now. Truly, truly, I say to you. And he, he questions their motivation and their attitude. You're seeking me because you have full bellies, is pretty much what it is. You have gorged on french fries and bacon, so now all of a sudden I'm popular. That's what he's saying, right? Uh, so let, let me just summarize this verse in my own words. A person can seek Jesus 
from the wrong motives, the wrong attitudes, the wrong goals. In other words, not all seekers are the same. Jesus is specifically challenging their motivation and their attitude. Motivation and attitude define why we do something. And motivation and attitude impacts everything. Motivation. Motivation is the reason or reasons pushing your behavior. When you are highly motivated, you go, 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 go. You don't need any encouragement. You're motivated. You're empowered. Motivation dictates the longevity of an action. When you're highly motivated, you keep going. Motivation in causes the person to be able to endure suffering. You feel the burn, but you are motivated, so you keep pressing forward. Motivation will impact everything connected to that activity. And the scary part about motivation is God judges our motivation. He calls us to account for what pushes our behavior. And that terrifies me, my friends. He looks into my heart of hearts and he sees why I do something. And that's where the first judgment takes place. That's what Jesus is doing in verse 26 to this crowd. He's judging them. For their motivation. How about attitude? Attitude is everything. Attitude impacts all. Attitude is the way you feel about something. So motivation is the power that pushes your activity. Attitude is how you feel about something. And that impacts stuff. Attitude dictates feelings. When you have a positive attitude, it is always sunshiny, even in the middle of a thunderstorm. It's raining and thundering, and if you've got a positive attitude, you're thanking the Lord for the rain because we need the water, and you know it's going to produce flowers, and the trees are going to love it. When you have a bad attitude, you can walk out in the sunshine, see the beautiful mountains and scenery, the green grass and the flowers, and you can condemn and curse it. Because, oh no, it's too hot. Attitude dictates feelings. Attitude reveals itself in everything. Attitude is just infectious. Attitude impacts everything the person does. It literally makes your whole day good or bad. And the worst part, my friends, God judges attitude as well. So you can have two people sacrifice their Saturday to come to the church property and serve the Lord on their one day off for the week. And you and I, we're just grateful they're here and serving the Lord. And thank you for sacrificing to do that. Yes, yes, yes. But God, in his all infinite knowledge, looks into both of those people and will judge their motivation and their attitude. And one person may be serving Saturday out of an act of love to God and gratitude to God. And they're willingly, they're grateful to make that sacrifice for that Saturday. Praise the Lord because he has done so much for me. And the person next to them may be doing it so their mom feels good about them. Same actions, radically different attitude and motivation. One is far more pure and godlier than the other. This was Jesus' problem with the Pharisees. Jesus would say, oh, the Pharisees, the self-righteous religious leaders, they pray a lot. Praying a lot is to be praised. 
But the Pharisees pray in order to be praised for their long prayers. Jesus judges the Pharisees for their motivation and their attitude, even in the midst of their good deeds. Jesus will say to the Pharisees, the self-righteous religious leaders, it is good to give alms to the poor. We should be generous and help those who need help. But Jesus looks into their hearts and will say, ah, but the Pharisees give alms in public so that people will go, look how generous that person is. Jesus calls them out for their attitude and their motivation. And that is terrifying as a follower of Jesus. We put so much emphasis on behavior modification. That's what we are all about, behavior modification. We do it as parents. We do it as employers. We do it in the church. This is how you are to behave. Do this, don't do that. Can't you read the sign? I'm sorry. Uh, do this, don't do that. Behavior modification. But if all we do is achieve behavior modification, but they're obeying for the wrong motives and attitudes, we have simply left them in failure. The struggle for behavior modification. The struggle. The battle for behavior modification is one with motivation and attitude. For me, if I change my motivation and attitude about something, my behavior automatically changes. In most basic, simple terms, let's talk about dieting. The D word. Nobody likes the D word, dieting unless you're on an ice cream, cheesecake, bacon diet. Oh my goodness, that sounds so good. Does that really exist? Somebody Google that. I, I need that website. I just made that up. I think, I think we ought to start something there. Dieting. If, if you love food and your motivation is to lose three pounds, that's not the correct motivation and attitude to get you to lose the weight. Because what happens is you will deny, deny yourself behavior modification till you lose those three pounds and then boom, you will gorge yourself and gain six, right? That's how it works. You lose three, you gain six. You lose three, you gain six. You lose three, you gain six. But if we change our motivation and attitude about food and we don't make it about weight loss, but we make it about healthy living, Good fuel for our body. If our motivation and attitude changes about food, then all of a sudden our diet changes and we start naturally losing weight. That idea of impacting behavior based on motivation and attitude can be applied to everything. Even obeying Jesus. It turns out God cares a great deal about our motivation and attitude. And if we will put the emphasis on our motivation and attitude toward God and his holiness, then behavior modification, obeying God, becomes that much easier. Boy, he condemned the crowd. You seek because you ate and your bellies are full. Ouch! That's a horrible condemnation because we know you're going to get hungry again. You know, are they chasing me because I'm handing out McDonald's gift cards? Is that what they're doing? And we talked about needing Jesus, seeking for Jesus, and finding Jesus last week. And it, if, you're, if you're seeking Jesus for the wrong reasons, you miss out. That's what Jesus is telling these people with a truly, truly. Exclamation point, exclamation point, shouting, listen to me, your motivation matters and your motivation is wrong, is what Jesus is saying. Billy Graham and the Cove, they tell us that most people come to Jesus in faith, belief, and trust 
seeking one of three things. And I'm grateful none of them are actually, you know, McDonald's gift cards or whatever. But the evangelistic, Billy Graham Evangelistic Association tells us that people come to God in faith, belief, and trust out of love for God. They realize God exists, God is big, God is good, and God loves them, and they need and want that love. I want to be unconditionally loved, and God offers that to me, so I grab a hold of God, putting my faith, my belief, my trust in Jesus Christ, and having my sins saved, uh, sins forgiven, and I am saved and adopted into his family. Love of God is a good reason to pursue and seek Jesus. And that's a feeling, it's an attitude, it's a motivation, it's a, I mean, it's all of that, right? Love of God, that's a good one. The second one that draws people to God, according to Billy Graham, is divine destiny. And that one's a little harder to wrap our arms around. Divine destiny means that you realize that you are a special creation and that God has a plan for you. Oh, God has a plan for me. Let me get on board. I need purpose in my life. Instead of wandering around purposeless. That was a lot of S's. I got through that without spitting too bad. And so you have a sense of purposeless. I need a reason to live. And so I come to God and receive my divine destiny. That's a good reason to seek God. And again, that flows from motivation and attitude and then impacts behavior. And then, of course, third, the third reason people come, love, divine destiny, and then fear of hell. I am a sinner. I have earned eternal punishment. I am on my way to eternal punishment. I better get right with God. <laughs> It's a good motivation. It's a good attitude. Jesus will save you from hell and damnation by forgiving you of your sins because there's power in the blood, right? It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. The crowd wasn't pursuing Jesus for any of those three reasons. It wasn't for love for God. It wasn't for divine destiny. And it wasn't out of fear of damnation and judgment. Not all seekers are the same, my friends. Why do you seek Jesus? If you're an active, intimate follower of Jesus now, what drew you to Jesus? It's good to think about that and go, oh, this is what drew, drew me in. It's a good question to ask other believers. And then it's a good thing to check with yourself as you are asking, seeking, and knocking, you're the widow bothering the judge, trying to get something done. Ask why this is so important to you. And check those attitudes and motivations because it affects everything, my friends. It affects everything. Why do you seek Jesus? I pray that our attitude and our motivation are pure. Are pure. Verse 26, truly, truly. Let's go back to the sermon in the sentence. The sermon on the sentence, the big idea to introduce the second verse, verse 27. The big idea is they misunderstood Jesus' mission and then they toiled for the wrong thing. John chapter 6, verses 26 through 27. I want to look at that scripture memory verse, which we are still all learning, still all learning. The, the first part is good because it repeats itself a little bit. John chapter 6 verse 27 says, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. We've been chewing on this verse for a while, and there's so much in this verse. Oh my, oh my goodness. Ah. So let me, let me just give you a, my quick summary of this. 
Physical and spiritual are contrasted. Physical food versus spiritual food are contrasted. And Jesus is the source of the enduring spiritual food. That's my summary for this verse. And out of this verse, I see three huge lessons. So from this verse, I want to talk about the three lessons I learned from this scripture memory verse that are all connected to physical and spiritual are contrasted, and Jesus is the source of enduring spiritual food. So the first lesson. The first lesson is don't waste your effort on garbage. Jesus said, do not work for the food which perishes. Don't put the time, effort, and energy into something that's going to mold and get thrown out. Don't waste your effort on garbage. This is literally, don't work for bread. But even more than that, it's don't work for full bellies. Don't work for things that are temporary. Our entire culture tells us to work on the temporary. If you're 10, you've already been indoctrinated to devote your life on garbage. And as adults, we struggle with this because everything around us tells us the garbage is valuable, the garbage is valuable, the garbage is valuable, when it really isn't. This whole idea of don't waste your effort on garbage just resonates with me from the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, which is easier to say than spell. Ecclesiastes. And the big idea of Ecclesiastes is life is worthless, meaningless without God. And so our culture tells us that we need to be pursuing stuff. What's important is your job title. What's important is your income, not. What's important is your hot spouse, not. What's important is your 401k, not. What's important is how early you get to retire, not. What's important is how many toys you have and make sure your toys are bigger and better than your neighbors, not. Devote your entire life to working 60, 70 hours a week so that your entire life is about your job so that when you retire, you realize you don't know your spouse, your children hate you, and then you die within a year. That's the American dream, my friends. And it's garbage. It's a lie. And, and we all... We all buy into it. And we just fall into that pattern. We never pause and ask, is this actually worth my life? Because nobody on their deathbed, right? You see those all over the time. Nobody on their deathbed wishes they had. And the list goes on and on. Advice from the hundred-year-old guy. You know, nobody wishes they worked more, that their house had one more bathroom. Unless you have teenage girls. Teenage girls, you need a, you need a, a whole separate bathroom for each teenage girl. And it doesn't matter, Dad, you're still going out in the woods. I mean, I'm just saying, that's the way, just personal experience. Nobody on their deathbed goes, my life would be so much better if I had a brand new truck. If I'd bought that boat. If I'd gotten one more digit off my handicap. Nobody wishes that. You lay on your deathbed and you regret all of that stuff. And you wish you had poured your time and energy and effort into truly valuable things. And what a horrible thing to be a hundred year old and realize you have wasted your life in the garbage dump 
all while paradise was right there around you. Let that not be you and I. Do not work for the food which perishes. Why? Why do you toil and work? What's your motivation? What's your attitude? Because your motivation and your attitude will radically impact everything. Why? Why do you get out of bed Monday morning? Why do you do what you do on your Friday night? Why are you here right now? We need to be asking these questions of ourselves. And I pray that the Holy Spirit is as brutally honest with you as he is with me, right? Um, Challenge us and chastise us, just like Jesus did to the crowd and the Pharisees. When you know your motivation and your attitude, you'll have much clearer purpose, my friends. One lesson down. Don't waste your effort on garbage, as I know most of us are. The second lesson from verse 27. Spend your effort on eternal spiritual stuff. In other words, what Jesus said, but for the food which endures to eternal life. This is literally toil toward faith in Jesus. In a broader sense, it's enduring Spiritual food is faith, belief, and trust in Jesus. It's also partaking in Jesus. Jesus is just starting his long discussion about him being the bread of life. And so he went from feeding the crowd French fries to being the French fries. And so spiritual food is going to get more and more complicated the more Jesus answers questions and talks to this crowd. But at the moment, in this verse, it's about faith. It's about faith, belief, and trust in Jesus Christ. But if you've already put your faith, your belief, your trust in Jesus Christ, as I did 30 plus years ago, the spiritual food now, the truly valuable things now, my friends, are how about godly character? Instead of wasting all your time on garbage, Waste your time, effort, and resources on godliness. Like James, the half-brother of Jesus. James, the half-brother of Jesus, who wrote the letter of James, articulating godly living for believers in Jesus Christ. Let's dedicate ourselves to living the letter of James. It will consume all of our activity. And in the end, we will be working for eternal, priceless treasures instead of garbage. We need, you know it, we need more godliness. Too many followers of Jesus are content to have a get-out-of-hell card. Otherwise, don't bother me unless it's Christmas and Easter. Instead of realizing... That there's victory, there's blessings, there's joy, there's fellowship, there's 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 as we walk on the spiritual journey with Jesus. And so every year there should be spiritual growth in our lives. Every decade there ought to be huge spiritual growth in our lives. And too many American Baptist Christians will go 10 years coming to church every time the doors are open and never ask if they're spiritually growing. And when they look, they realize they've spent 10 years in a building, but they haven't grown in godliness at all. Shame on us. Shame on us. Let's pursue godly character as eternal, spiritual valuables that go on. How about like the Apostle Paul? And let's pursue the eternal spiritual treasure that is service.
to the kingdom of God and to God himself. Service, service, service. Today we remember and honor our service members who have given all, who have served, who are serving, and the spouses and children who have to endure the sacrifices of that service. But how about like the Apostle Paul, we serve a greater nation than America by serving the kingdom of God. Let's get busy. As princes and princesses of the king, we are ambassadors and so much more. And so let's get busy devoting our time and resources into treasure that is valuable by serving him. There are an awful lot of serving opportunities here. There's open vacancies. Ready? Let's serve. The Apostle Paul stepped up and said, yes, yes, yes. And he went on to write most of the New Testament, start most of the churches, and have a long-lasting impact. Isn't that better than a garage full of garbage that the people you leave behind will sell? Godly character, service, and then uh, Enoch. Love a good Enoch story. We don't talk enough about Enoch. I can at least spell Enoch, E-N-O-C-H. Enoch. Enoch walked with God and was no more. Genesis, right? Enoch walked with God and was no more. That describes to me a nearness to God that we don't even want, we don't pursue, we're not even interested in. To be so near God in fellowship and companionship that you spend every day walking with God wherever you are. That's Enoch with God. And at some point in Enoch's life, at the end of the day, God realizes that Enoch and him are closer to his house than Enoch's house. And God just says, why don't you just come home with me? Enoch walked with God and then was no more. Let that be something that we pursue with all of our being, to be so near and connected to God every moment of our day. Let's be so heavenly-minded and so spiritual that we are walking and living in the Spirit so that God works in and through us, my friends. Let that be something we devote our lives to. That's impact. That's worth you. That's the legacy we want to pass on. It can be powerful. It can be beautiful. It is worth it, my friend. Lesson number two, spend your effort on eternal spiritual stuff. We know we aren't. Why do you not work for spiritual food? Why don't you? Why don't you have a position in this church where you wear three hats? Why aren't you spending more time in your Bible than you are on your app? Why don't you have more scripture memorized and meditated on than song lyrics? I have a lot of song lyrics memorized. That was personally convicting. Haters are going to hate. Oh, no, sorry. Right? Why do you not work for spiritual food? Other than you're too distracted by garbage. All right, let's move on to number three. Number three, my friends, the three lessons I got from our scripture memory verse. Eternal spiritual stuff comes from Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus which Jesus says, which the Son of Man shall give you. The Son of Man shall give you. So this is future. Jesus is making a future reference to his immediate context of talking to the crowd. So is it about Jesus dying on the cross or rising from the dead or the Holy Spirit descending? There's great debate. 
except that Jesus is the source. I like how he uses the title Son of Man, which is his favorite reference. But Son of Man is an end-time eschatological prophet. This is a prophet who speaks the word of the Lord before the wrath of God falls. Uh, Son of Man is the person who screams, Repent, for the wrath of God will destroy us all tomorrow. And so I think that's what Jesus is saying here. You're wasting your life on garbage and you've got one more chance to choose to devote your life to eternal things because the end is near. The wrath of God falls tomorrow. Time is limited. Time is one of the only resources we can never get more of. And that frustrates me to all kinds of ends. He's the son of man and he shall give to you the spiritual, the eternal. The stuff that's valuable. Yes, yes, yes. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then Jesus makes a reference that he is sealed by the Father. I love that. Sealing. What in the world? Sealing. Is that some kind of canning reference? Vacuum sealing meat? We do seal stuff. Ziploc bags with the click and zip. I like those because when I grew up, they didn't have the click and zip. And when you sealed Ziploc bags, you had about a 30% chance of actually doing it. And then mom yelled at you like, it's not my fault. I did the click and zip, you know. Sealing like the wax seals on the scroll in the book of Revelation, the seven seals is wax poured on an envelope to seal the envelope and stamped with the royal seal. And so you had, you had to be an authorized member of the king to break that seal. So the seal had authority. The seal had power. The seal had consequences. <laughs> and in the New Testament, every time seal is used, It is used in connection to the Holy Spirit, my friends. I am sealed in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. You are sealed in the Holy Spirit. If you have put your faith, your belief, your trust in Jesus. This being sealed by the Father is probably a reference to Jesus being baptized. Because when Jesus was being baptized, God the Father spoke from the clouds. This is my beloved Son. God the Son was the one being immersed into the water and getting wet. And then God the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus and remained. But look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 says, Give us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge, as a down payment. So our hearts are sealed with the Holy Spirit as a, as a down payment for future That's beautiful. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. How about Ephesians? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 says this. Having also believed, Ephesians 1, 13. Having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. He's a pledge. He's a promise of our names in the Lamb's book of life and being able to spend all eternity in the presence of a holy God. Even the the next verse, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, given as a pledge of our inheritance. See how cool that is? Staying in Ephesians for one more verse, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. (laughs) Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Right? So Jesus offers us the seal of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He's in our hearts. He's a pledge. He's a promise. We are sealed for the day of redemption. Praise the Lord for his mark on us. That is beautiful. That is very beautiful. And we only have that mark in us because of Jesus. So, You may want spiritual, eternal things and go to all the wrong sources. 
and it seems like there's more and more wrong, deceptive sources for getting spiritual treasure. But the New Testament is clear. The only source of valuable, eternal, spiritual stuff is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is it. Come to Jesus, the source of truly valuable things. Because he's the only one that can offer you a life that's not just garbage and wastefulness. Without Jesus, you're the walking dead. And you have nothing but judgment and punishment ahead of you. Judgment and punishment that you know you earned and deserve. But when you come to Jesus, he wipes that all away. He radically changes us. He forgives us of our sins. Then he fills us and seals us with the Holy Spirit so that all the presence of God dwells in each believer of Jesus. Then he gives us adoption into his family so that we are sons and daughters of God. We are princes and princesses in the kingdom of God. He grafts us into the vine so that his power flows into us. And then he gives us divine purpose. And our divine purpose is not to be wasted in the junkyard or the dump, but to service in the kingdom of God. So will you come to Jesus and receive the spiritual food that endures forever and ever, the truly valuable stuff, my friends. Jesus stands ready to pour all that out if you'll just receive it. He's offering a gift that you just have to have, grab a hold of. Will you?